Hey everyone, welcome to the Entry Point Hunting Podcast. Justina Lee Stoltz here with my co-host. Drew Vincent. And today we are super excited to have our guest Dan on the show. Um, Dan started his obsession with hunting and shooting at the age of eight in the fields of Southern Alberta, as you do. And he quickly developed a passion and interest in precision shooting and was lucky enough to build a solid foundation of marksmanship skills that has taken him all over the world hunting and competing in long range precision shooting events. He still has the same passion today, and his hunting style stems from this precision rifle background. He loves teaching these techniques to enhance the skills of other passionate hunters and shooters, and we are super excited to have him on the show today to answer all the questions that everyone has ever had about how the heck you become a better and more precise shooter. So without further ado, let's welcome Dan to the show. Ta-da! Thank you, Justine, <laughs> for that. That was excellent. Perfect. So, I mean, um, Dan, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on um, what an eight-year-old is doing shooting guns out in the fields of Alberta. How did that happen and how did you get to that that point? I'm not sure exactly where it started. Uh, I think it started with a Crossman air rifle when I was somewhere around that age, eight, seven or eight, something like that. And, uh, and just, you know, small game hunting, uh, having a bit of fun out in the fields. We lived on the edge of a small town, so rural sort of environment. And yeah, I just developed a passion for seeing how far I could hit things accurately. And that, uh, that developed into 22s and, and some other center fire uh, chamberings as well too. But it always sort of had that background of uh, how far can I accurately get this round on target? Um, you know, how can I use that to my advantage when it comes to hunting? not just sort of ring of steel as well and, and become a more effective, efficient and ethical hunter. And that's sort of, I guess, where it started. I was, I was pretty lucky as a kid, my parents would send me to uh, these sort of firearms training camps on weekends, just sort of weekend type camps. And I uh, got the chance to develop some, uh, some fundamentals and some, some good habits pretty early. And, uh, and that sort of just developed bit by bit. And I never really lost that passion. I, Sort of, you know, lived in Australia for a, a lot of years of my life, and and uh, had some fun out there doing the same sort of thing. And back here now, and it, dang, the passion never really ends. It's uh, like you said, that's pretty pretty much wrapped it up. So, what when you first started, what was considered? What would you have considered a a long shot? Uh, and then how did how quickly did that progress? Yeah, so that's a good point, I guess. You know, with the uh, the good old pump Crossman air rifle. <laughs> 100 yards is probably pretty far. There was uh, many a gopher that uh, was, uh, you know, feared the, the air rifle back in the day. So, um, yeah, that was probably about 100 yards was was where I'd be pushing it with those little 177 pellets. But, uh, you know, before I knew what I was doing with the 22 long rifle side of things, um, just with, you know, an old Cooey, you know, back in the day when you're young, I think 200 yards was starting to push it for that. You jump into some center fire chamberings and you know a two two three six hundred yards is pretty far and get into the six five creed more and you know fifteen hundred yards is pretty far and you know it goes up from there so yeah i think uh i think as as you go up and play with different toys that your uh your definition of long range definitely increases what's the longest that you shoot now um accurately and repeatedly <laughs> Is that's a different question. I think uh, about a mile is what we usually sort of bang at uh, these days for the ELR type stuff we play around with. Uh, the precision uh, competitions that I do, the PRS style competitions, that's between you know eight and twelve hundred or so yards. So wow. And what's yep. the uh, the the Wild West long shot, the one that you've tried to take and maybe once or twice hit it? Yeah. Uh, just over a mile, I'd say, is probably about as far as I've ever got. Wow. And that it, you get there, but uh, it's at the end of the 6.5 Creedmoor, basically. So it's coming down like a rock at that point. <laughs> but, well, yeah. And like, how many considerations are there when you're shooting at that kind of range? Well, I mean, I guess long range shooting in general, you know, if we're at 100 yards, it's pretty limited for what most people are shooting and, and starting to shoot. When you start getting long range, what are the different variables that you're having to take into account yeah great question there are lots and you have to reach a point in basically what you're trying to achieve where you stop 
going down the rabbit hole or you just cut off your variables. So you can get all the way into Coriolis effects, spin drift, um, uh, vertical jump, uh, things like that. But generally speaking, uh, your your drop data for your particular round, which is true to your particular round in your rifle setup, that's super important. Um, the biggest con- consideration is wind, obviously. Being able to read the wind. No, knowing knowing wind is most of, of long-range shooting. Um, and yeah, I think temperature, humidity, uh, density, altitude are the three biggest besides wind and your drop data. That's a lot of things to be trying to think about yeah. when you're not to mention like your body position and where your rifle is and how yeah. it's like supported up against your body and all of those other, you know, minor details, let alone the rotation of the earth and the wind and the density of the air. Yeah, for sure. For sure. The fundamentals of marksmanship is probably what I'm going to get into a little bit later. And that's, that's a lot of what you're saying there with, with the body and exactly what you're doing and the, the habits, the muscle memory that you've built over years. Um, that that should be sort of more or less automatic but when it comes to variables that can change it's uh it's mo- it's mostly wind drop data and and your your environmentals as far as you know da and and temperature and stuff like that yeah i guess that's kind of a, a good thing to differentiate there's there's controllable factors which is all of the fundamentals of marksmanship which you said you know we will Correct. talk about yeah. and then all of the uncontrollable variables which are are the things that you just mentioned as well as far as wind and and all that kind of stuff true yeah especially yeah. wind and especially, that and how that yeah. re- relates to hunting as well too you know uh, we're not taking shots at, at 12 1500 yards at an animal but um some people do push it a little bit farther and, and the more you know, solid your fundamentals are, the more comfortable you are with your, your rifle system and, and confident you are, the farther you can ethically push those type of shots. And, and for me, uh, I've a limit, I've put a limit on myself of 500 yards in, in good conditions. Some people will push that well past you know, eight, 900 yards, depending, but it's kind of individual and depends a lot on your fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. I would, that was going to be a question that I asked is what is in your mind an ethical distance to shoot at? And, and you just said for you, for you, it's 500. Um, and some people will push further than that. I can't even, yeah, I can't even imagine yeah. <laughs> like even not shooting at an animal, like shooting at a target. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Past, past 200 is, uh, is stretching things. It's, it's a very personal thing and it should be, it, it should be, have a lot to do with, with, how confident you are, your, your physical system, your mental game, things like that. It's, it's a very personal thing, but yeah, yeah, you have to be careful and you have to, you have to spend a bit of time to do it right. Cause ethically been able to take, take an animal ethically is, is super important to me. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's amazing. Like the, the range gets real busy, uh, three days before hunting season opens where everybody trying to just, and, and like I was, I was gone. I lived out of country for a couple of years and then coming back and, and getting back into shooting and uh, embarrassingly being like, man, like you don't realize how much drops off. It seems pretty simple. And I think to non hunters, that's always the big thing. It's, there's almost like a mocking of people that maybe don't get hunting with like, ah, point the gun, pull the trigger. And it's like, find the animal, get a good sight on it, make sure it's good, get a good shot. And then, you know, all the work afterwards, but there's, there's a lot to shooting a gun. And, and even though we get the best equipment, it's, it's insane. And what would you put to someone that's, that's maybe even like new into shooting? What would you put as the priority things to maybe start off? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, up to hunting season, the range gets super busy. People are taking their three shots a year kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and that's important, but, um, I actually met a guy at the range the other day. Who's like, yep, don't shoot my gun except for right before hunting season, three yeah. shots, make sure it's still straight. And away we go. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. my God. There's a lot of that <laughs> in, in my mind uh, as well too, you know, you can be a, a great hunter and, and finding animals is a huge part of it. But if your, your tool, if your, your weapon is a rifle, you need to be able to use it. You need to be able to be super confident with it. And no matter how good of a hunter you are, you need to be a good marksman as well, too. Mm-hmm. You need to have those fundamentals of marksmanship. And I think that's really important. I think it, it makes you a better hunter at the end of the day, a more ethical hunter and a more successful hunter, too. So I guess to answer your question, uh, as far as those sort of fundamentals, I guess is what you're getting at is uh, um, I think 
the, there's uh, breaking into three categories. Uh, stable position is is a big one. Breathing and trigger control, and I sort of have a lot of subcategories for there. But uh, what you should really sort of focus on, I guess, when you when you first get into it, and uh, and you're just practicing, and you should practice a lot. They should shoot more than three rounds a year. You should, <laughs> You should get behind your rifle and you should practice because there's nothing, nothing replaces trigger time. But, uh, basically I think you'd, you'd want to start if you're, if you're just getting into this, you want to really focus on your prone position. Now that's, that's the most stable position you can shoot a rifle from. Um, laying down for those of you who have yeah. no idea what prone is laying right. down on your belly bipod in a rear bag. So this is, this is how you prove, uh, loads for your rifle. This is how you do load development. It's how you, you choose and verify the factory ammo. It's how you zero your rifle. You get get on your stomach, uh, bipod and rear bag. You can do it on a bench as well too. It's pretty good. Stable if you have a bipod and rear bag that is. Uh, I, I tend not to do that just because that's not how I shoot in the field. It's not how I shoot in competition. It's uh, I want to practice verifying my data, verifying my rifle, how I'm going to use it. So that's pretty important to me, but, but, uh, there's nothing wrong with the bench as well too. But, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you're prone, you're at a bench. I think the number one thing that you really need to work on is being square to your target. So a lot, a lot of people when they're prone and I'm, I'm going to sort of refer to that mostly than behind a bench. Sometimes you're a little limited behind a bench, depending on how the cutout of the bench is. But, uh, as far as prone goes, being square to your, uh, to your target is super, super important. So, your rifle, your 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 shoulders, hips, knees, everything should be square. You should have your legs splayed, but you should be very square to your target. Uh, you see a lot of people that are sort of have a have a an angle cocked like that to the side, and uh, it doesn't help you as far as the the, the line of the recoil uh, mitigation needs to be coming straight back. So being square is is number one, uh, and. One of the most important things I'm going to talk about today is that is the importance of cheek weld, getting mm-hmm. your face on your rifle, and that that leads a little bit into rifle setup too, which I think I'll touch on a bit later. But um, having the cheek um, or your, your cheek riser on your rifle attached to your face exactly the same way, exactly the same pressure every single time. So you should be square. Your your rifle should be sitting sort of on your collarbone. This is another sort of point here. A lot of people assume that um, out, out in the pocket here, just or just sitting on your shoulder on your delt there, is where normal rifle butts go. But if you really want to sort of get square, you have no choice but to bring that rifle stock right in over your collarbone. It allows you to drop your face straight onto the comb. Which we've discovered, uh, thanks to Dan taking me out and correcting all of my bad things that I was doing up until now, correcting them so that I can develop new good habits. Um, yeah, I was not square before, and I don't. My face doesn't fit my rifle. The butt on my yeah. rifle is not the right shape for my face, so I need to uh, make some corrective purchases to fix that. That's true. Yeah, and and it is super important. It's uh, you buy a rifle off the shelf. It may or may not fit you. Everybody is a little bit different. Every rifle is a little bit different. There are there are things you can do. Having adjustability in your rifle is super awesome if you can if you have that. Uh, most sort of standard stocked rifles don't have a lot of adjustability. But as far as length of pull, maybe we'll get into that first. Maybe that's sort of a prerequisite for for some of these fundamentals. So as far as rifle setup, the things that are super duper key is the length of pull which is just your, the distance between where you're going to shoulder your rifle and, uh, your, to the, your, basically your trigger shoe. So there's ways of measuring it, things like that. You know, bigger people need longer, shorter people less. And I like to sort of hook the butt of my rifle in, in the, uh, sort of between my, on the other side of my elbow here and just measure to your index finger where you're going to place your finger on the trigger. You need that to be, yeah, here to there. This distance. Trigger should be uh, about yeah. on your first joint and first knuckle. That's yeah. where your trigger, trigger sort of should, should end up when you're sort of sticking in the crotch of your arm like that. So if you can get that pretty close, it's uh, it's super helpful. Um, the even more important than that, like we we're saying, is the cheek height. So that's that's where a lot of rifles sort of fall over. You just get a standard standard stocked rifle. It may or may not fit you. Have a Monte Carlo sort of rise that can help. Um, if you have an adjustable cheek pad, that's great. That's super helpful. But the point being is when you drop your face down behind your rifle uh, and, and your scope height as well too is, is kind of 
what rings you have kind of dictates that a little bit. You can and level. Apparently when your scope's yeah. on an angle like this, it's not so bueno. Scope, scope level, that's <laughs> super important um, as well. But uh, yeah, as, as far as getting your, your face dropping and uh, and that has to that has to have a bit of pressure. You have to not be hovering. That's the thing a lot of people do is sort of hover their cheek. They're using their neck muscles to hold their head up to get a side picture, um, and that's not repeatable. So, so basically, uh, things have to be repeatable 100% of the time. Every single time, you have to be doing the same thing. That's that's where accuracy comes from is, is repeatability. So yeah, be able to uh, to have it uh, your cheek height just correct. You can get strap on pads, things like that. You can sometimes some military guys will just take little bits of foam and just tape the butt of the rifle up until they get it just right. But it has to be able to drop the weight of your head onto, onto that stock and just hook it right under your cheekbone. So you got bone connection here. There's no, no squishy bits going on. There's, you know, there's a little bit obviously, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's bone connection. The weight of your head is sitting onto your stock and that gives you perfect sight picture. So that's super critical. Um, that's probably the second most or, or maybe even the first most important thing when it comes to repeatable accuracy. Uh, that sort of relays into um, your, um, as far as your scope setup goes, your uh, eye relief. So that's a setup of the scope. Um, every scope's a little bit different, sliding it forward and back in your rings at max magnification uh, to get the, the right picture you're not getting shadow you know that that sort of black shadow that comes in if you're left right up down forward or back left right up and down up and down that's your cheek height left right is your uh is how your sort of face interfaces with your stock forward and back is a is a measure of your your scope um sliding forward and back in the ring so that has to be right so basically you're just you know and this is this is kind of all what you'd call natural point of aim so you shoulder your rifle or you get behind it, it comes in collarbone at the same point, and your face drops on it in the same point. You could close your eyes, you could open them, and you have a perfect sight picture. It's a natural point of aim. That's just that just becomes natural. You do that thousands and thousands of times. It just is there. You don't have to worry about that. And it takes time to set that up. Like when we did my rifle, we probably spent like an hour, hour and a half, like moving the scope around and making sure that it all worked with my eye and it's different for each Everyone. person's eye the scope the person the gun everything is different um so it takes time it's not it's not something you just like whip out in five minutes and then you're ready to go at the range like it's something that takes yep. some time to do yeah you should definitely take a bit of time to do that um the other thing that we did justine as well too as you remember is your diopter adjustment oh, God, this is the this worst. is the, the fast focus <laughs> on the end of your ocular uh and that's that's completely unique to every single person's eyes. A little bit different, um, and and that's that's to allow your eye to work less hard when uh, it's when you're looking through a scope. So your your uh, parallax in your scope uh, is your your focus, your side focus. You obviously need that pretty close. But have you, you done this, Drew? I'll, I'm sitting here being like. It's a good thing I didn't get a shot on anything. You know, I've, I've benched and everything. But I'm like, it's the you don't know what you don't know. And I'm, I know. I, you know, how it, Justine and I ran into each other at the uh, the archery range one day. And we're sitting, and then I went back in and did some lessons with the guy. And same thing, like it was, like I was a, a pretty consistent shot. But I spent time with him, and it was like, oh, like I I didn't even get out of grade one here. And I'm listening <laughs> to this, being like. You know, I'm I'm slamming notes out, and there's just so much information that it's yeah. you know, and and I don't know if anyone that I know knew, knew any of this stuff. You just you buy a no. gun, you go, you figure out how to get it so that your eye sees the thing, and, and it's not black around the outside. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, about there, and then and then you just tried to to repeatedly shoot that, and I'm, I'm like, this is good information. Yeah, yeah. it's it's critical, especially that last piece about the. What is it? The diopter yeah, thing? Yeah, your ocular That thing diopter, is yeah. is so hard to figure out because, um, and Dan had said this to me when we were trying to do it on mine, your eye is this incredible work of uh, magic that will just correct for what it sees. So it, you have to like close and open your eye 800 bajillion times to try and figure out 
where are those that little crosshair the clearest without your eye correcting for it because your eye will automatically make it clear every right. single time after like one second of your eyes being open yep yeah absolutely right so it and and just means that your eyes working super hard you're going to get fatigued so just quickly to to be able to do that uh, um i can jump into more detail or less depending here but uh as far as what you're trying to do is the focus of your reticle so you're not you don't want to be looking at anything through your scope so a uh, blank sky a blank wall that's well lit basically um don't worry about what you're looking through. You're just focusing on the reticle and you, that fast focus eye piece in the back there, the one closest to you, you basically have to close your eye after you've got a good, good cheek weld. You, you close your eye and you just give it a couple seconds to rest. Open your eye and the very first thing that you notice about the clarity of the reticle and you play with your diopter, which is like a set of glasses for your particular eye. It's going to be different for everyone. And you get it so that when you open your eye after a little rest period, it's crystal clear. Your eye's not working. It's not trying to compensate because you might not notice it if you have a, a, a you know, what you're looking at through your scope is is, blur, or is, uh, is complicated. You, you totally don't notice it. Your eye just instantly compensates and it's working a lot harder than it has to. So you spend a bit of time looking through glass. You'll, you'll really appreciate that. And it, and it helps too with the, uh, the combination of that allows your parallax on your scope to be super efficient and to, to act like a focus knob. You don't have your diopter set right, your parallax isn't going to work well, and you're going to have different planes going on as you move your eye around in your scope. That introduces issues it's with accuracy. Exhausted eyeballs. That's what you're going to have. Exhausted that, eyeballs and not a clear shot. <laughs> that too, yeah, yeah. But uh, but over distance as well too, when you don't have your parallax set right and or your diopter set right, that introduces issues when it comes to accuracy. So. Mm -hmm. Super important. It's this That's just wild. all like the fundamentals of setting yourself. You haven't even got to shoot a bullet yet. Yeah, no. <laughs> You're not even at the range. You're still in somebody's basement, like playing with little tools to try and get everything to work. Yeah. Yeah. That I, and I, having your scope level. Yeah. That's the, that's the other sort of that uh, issue there. Having your scope level. So that's sort of the basic sort of rifle setup. It's, it's so interesting because I think that the, the prep work for hunting when when i first got in I, I can't speak for everyone is the thing that's so easy to to completely ignore you're like i don't know i got it it shoots straight i'm consistent when i'm shooting out of a sled and and then you go out and you spend the time and then um you know looking for animals and that's a whole other topic but um <laughs> but but yeah i think you're saying things and i'm like oh yeah i have no like the the parallax i've noticed that i'm like i don't know what's it even like is it, it I, just, it's there. And so it's really yeah. interesting to hear all of this. Yeah. It's yeah. like the fine tuning of your rifle to you so that when you do go sit on a bench or you do go lay prone out in a field, yeah. you can actually get the absolute maximum um, accuracy and precision out of your rifle because it's completely attuned to you. Like you might be able to shoot decently straight and okay and like hit your four or five inch grouping every time at 100 or 200 yards um but if you want to do a dance show me pictures of put bullets through the same hole at 100 and 200 yards like you're you can totally fine tune your shooting setup to be custom to you yep very very <laughs> important yeah your rifle has to fit you 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 can't make yourself fit around your rifle it's never going to work it's never going to be repeatable yeah yeah, so, so that's super important. Rifle setup, I think we can use that as a bit of a, a preempt to a lot of the sort of shooting fundamentals per se. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's important. And I think we were just in stable position being square. That's where it sort of laid into that, just dropping your head down. You're not cocking your head, you know, leaning onto a, onto a cheek weld that's not right for you. You're not hovering, you're not using your, your neck muscles to do that. Because uh, another sort of uh, overlaying, concept i guess is that uh your rifle and your body is a system and people people sort of forget that a lot of the time you're you're almost you need to be in tune with each other and almost like a tuning fork you know if you're if you're gripping your bag really hard with your left hand you're using your forearm muscles and that's uh you know that's introducing difference in when your shot breaks compared to if you weren't you know holding your head up on you know, hovering around trying to find your sight picture that's using neck and back muscles it's not repeatable it's 
it, it has to be you have to be in tune so i think being square is a bit is a big one the cheek weld that's a natural point of aim sort of covered that uh the next and probably the most important aspect of of breaking a good shot is trigger control and this is where a lot of people sort of yeah <laughs> we discovered i have zero trigger control when we first started out at the field the other day <laughs> yeah so it's uh, one of my instructors once said to me that the trigger is the steering wheel of your rifle system so you can steer it left right or up or down basically with how you how you do it and it needs to be repeatable so i was lucky enough to sort of uh, develop some of these these skills and uh, I guess habits right the first time. I know a lot of guys that uh, I shoot with competitively that have had a lifetime of trying to unlearn bad habits. And this is why I'm so thankful that we're doing this now because all of the like the the one year or less than a years of experience of of shooting or hunting or whatever that I have um, is even enough time to develop bad habits and to have. Yeah. Uh, a habit of just completely letting my trigger finger do whatever it wants after I pull the trigger, um, which is really, really hard to correct and and do something that's repeatable when you've just done nothing consciously for the entire time that you've been doing something. Yeah, and and again, like you don't you don't know that you should or shouldn't be doing something, right? So yeah. it's easy to make these habits. They're absolutely overcomable. You can you can train that out. That's not a problem. And practice. Dry fire practice is a huge thing. Um, I do a lot of dry fire practice in my living room. I have a question. I always, always, uh, always in my less than a year, um, heard that like dry fire was not so great for your gun. Is that true or false? True so, or false? <laughs> big can of worms here. Um, <laughs> I am quite firmly on the camp that dry fire is fine. Absolutely fine. So okay. there are a few caveats, but it's, Generally speaking, any rifle that is newer than 40 years old is not going to have a problem. And any centerfire rifle is completely fine. So uh, back in the day, old school rimfire rifles, uh, let's say made in the 50s or 60s or so, uh, it was not a good idea to dry fire them. Your firing pin would contact the edge of the chamber and you'd start to peen that uh it's not, it wasn't a great idea. So today, modern rimfire rifles, even uh, my rimfire competition rifle, I dry fire all the time. It's not a problem. There are stops in your firing pin. It doesn't allow it to contact the side of your chamber. Huh. Center fire rifles. I have rifles. been like <laughs> counting the shots and like giving my girlfriend crap because I'm like, no, 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 Like that was the last one. And like I thought. Oh, pull the trigger. Like, rim fires. I knew center fires or I believed center fires weren't, weren't a big deal. But like rim fires, you, I, same thing. It's like, no, nope, yeah. you're going to break the firing pin. It's just done. So, yeah, it's a hammer. You, you'll get a lot of guys, probably even modern guys that will uh, argue with me about this. And I get a lot of that. Uh, all all modern rim fires do have firing pin stops. So the 1022, um, any of the bolt actions, they do have a stop. Now, if you were to sit there and do it 10,000 times, you're eventually probably, depending on the quality of that pin stop, uh, whether it's a roll pin or, or built into your firing pin itself, you know, it, things can happen. I don't worry about it for myself personally. It's you, you sort of, you know, mileage may vary. You might want to do a bit of research on your particular rifle. Same, same goes with center fire. The firing pin drops into dead space. There's a huge shoulder on the firing pin that contacts the inside of the bolt face. You're not going to run into any issues there. And again, if, if you have a poor, you know, really crappy quality rifle, let's say, or and or there were some uh, manufacturing defects in it. You, know, you might get unlucky. I, I've heard of it happen. So it, it can happen. I'm not saying it'll never, ever happen. But I believe... Caveat. Dan does not guarantee that you yeah, won't wreck your I shit. Won't fix everything. <laughs> so that's, having said that, I really believe in the value of dry fire practice. It's hugely valuable. It teaches you a lot without the concussion of a round going off it teaches you a lot about how your body reacts and it gives you practice that you can do in your basement mm -hmm. it's it's super valuable i i i do i don't know how many hundreds of of rounds of dry fire practice every week probably lots so mm. okay that's super important i think 
Um, well, I mean, being able to do that dry fire practice, because it is like, I mean, if I'm shooting 270, 30 odd six, A, I'm having to go to the range, um, and B, you're getting blasted every time. You don't want to be putting a ton down. So, you know, I picked up snap caps and things that, that I helped. But if I'm able to go and just repeatedly put, you know, a bunch of, of practice pulls on it, that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And nothing wrong with snap caps. They're great. You can get them for rimfire as well, too. They don't last very long with rimfire because you're hammering the side of that rim. It's a piece of plastic. Centerfire uh, snap caps are great. I, I use them sometimes, too, because it allows you to run the full bolt, get the get the whole feeling of, of rounds going out the side and new ones coming in. So, yeah, if you're at, at all worried about the uh, quality of your of your firing pin or your, or your bolt or whatever, run a bunch of snap caps. That's fantastic. You don't even have to run it out. You can grab one, just lift your bolt, put it back down, cocks your rifle, it stays in the chamber. It's uh, it's it's super good that way. So don't be afraid of dry fire. That's that's what I say. Okay. <laughs> but uh, this this podcast has already paid dividends for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's super good. Um, but as far as trigger control, let's get into that because that that's that's really what you're doing here. That's how you're interfacing with your rifle system to send a round down range. And the first thing that you want to guess get right is where the trigger blade contacts your your trigger finger and a lot of people will hook the trigger finger in into the first joint uh first knuckle on your trigger finger it should be halfway in between that and the tip so right in the meaty part of the pad on the first joint of your finger right right there so you don't want to have that ho hooked along in your joint so no just cap no captain hooks yep <laughs> Correct. So you want to be pulling straight back. And uh, while you're pulling straight back, you don't want to be jerking it. Obviously, that's everybody knows that. You don't sort of slam your trigger down. But the way I sort of learned and kind of helped me a lot is to practice and pretend that I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, you know, got my side picture. I'm exactly where I want to fire. We'll get into breathing just a little bit later, but you're, you're ready to fire. And you have a couple seconds here, you're just applying constant slow pressure to your trigger, and it's gonna more or less surprise you. You're gonna know if you you know your rifle after a while, you pretty much know when it's gonna go off because of how much pressure you're feeding it. But you're pretending that you're drawing a line in the dirt, let's say with your index finger, and you're just very, very slowly applying pressure and drawing the line, line in the in the dirt if it was on a vertical plane or whatever until it breaks and you're not going to know when it breaks you're, you're going to know roundabout but you're not it's going to surprise you a little bit and it should that's that's kind of how you're you you get around anticipation and uh and flinching you can it's it's easy if you're shooting a magnum caliber to develop a flinch super easy and the way around it dry fire because you will know you'll start to know and you'll you'll start to be able to tell when you flinch and why when you don't have that massive concussion going off so i was definitely a flincher yeah definitely a flincher uh not so much now with my uh 308 but when i shoot handguns oh man i flinch like a motherfucker yeah. <laughs> like it's... every single time I, and it's bad because i'm never paying attention to when uh the chamber is empty and it just like stays open and the gun's done and you're done yep. with your mag and then, and, you pull and then again. i pull and i'm yeah. like Whoa! and then yeah. my buddy's always like oh, i saw you you flinched I'm like no don't look yep. at me <laughs> you know you know the way around uh, a, good, a good sort of drill as well too when it comes to pistols like that get get your friend if, if he reloads it all get a magazine with two or three dummy rounds in it mm. and you don't know where they are and you can do the exact same thing. So you're not expecting if you're counting or whatever, you're not expecting which one it is and you'll see, and it'll just, it'll show you yeah. video yourself. Do you see, see how you do that? That'll, that'll teach you a lot. So yeah. Yeah. Fishing is natural. Guns are super loud, a lot louder than people think they are really. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it just comes with, with repetition and practice. You know, I think I, I still even do it to some degree. So yeah. And I think two things that probably make, people flinch or at least two of the things that I think made me flinch uh one was sound at first uh it doesn't bother me so much anymore but like it is loud and if you don't have proper ear protection on uh it can be painful painfully loud 
And then two, recoil. Everyone anticipates recoil um, and something that Dan had talked to me about and, and um, other people have said as well is you should be one with your gun. Like you, there shouldn't be a, a looseness to the way mm -hmm. that you're holding. Like you get recoil when you're not holding your gun tight to your collarbone into your chest. And man, the day that Dan and I went out and like fixed my gun and, and, and me, mostly me, uh, and I had like the biggest bruise on my collarbone because for probably the first five or six rounds that I let out of my gun, I was just like slamming into me mm -hmm. and out. And then when I went to the range last weekend, I held on to that thing for dear life and held it tight so that I was just one unit and no, no recoil, no bruising, no flinching. Um, and that makes a big difference is holding your gun tight. Like it's actually a piece of you. Yep. They call that driving the rifle. So definitely no space between you and the rifle. You'll be Forward proud of pressure. this. An old man at the range came over and said, you shoulder that gun better than I could. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, Dan would be go. so proud of me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's awesome. That's super good to hear. And I wanted to say to him, it's not supposed to go in your shoulder, buddy. That's why. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shoulders it's a, natural, a wide it's, section. It's a natural spot to put it a lot of time. And, and offhand shooting, it's, it is a bit more natural when you are offhand kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just put in that outer pocket and it's, it's sort of a natural putt. But it just forces you to have to drop your head to the side yeah. to do what you want to do. And you really don't need to do that. So, yeah. That's super important. Okay, but back to trigger control. Sorry, trigger control. I keep, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> keep side railing it. So yeah, it basically yeah, just uh, constant, constant pressure, even pressure uh, until it breaks. And the most important thing after that is your follow through. And this is where a lot of people sort of fall ah. over is uh, holding that pressure, whatever pressure you're feeding it until it breaks, you need to hold that same amount of pressure for a good two count. Give yourself a good two seconds. So a lot of people assume uh, the bullets left the barrel. What does it matter? And it's, it's kind of the exact same concept as the follow through on a golf swing. There's actually a lot of parallels between precision shooting and golf, funnily enough. <laughs> and, uh, you're trying to take a small object and put it way down there exactly where you want it. Yeah. Uh, follow through on a swing is just as important. So you, you don't just hack away at a golf ball and toss your club kind of thing. You don't let your <laughs> finger off until uh, you, you at least like I used to give myself a good one, two, like two second count kind of thing. And I still do that. Um, same with, with semi-autos as well too. You don't let that trigger reset for a good two seconds. You'll hear that click, give yourself a few a full two seconds. So absolutely critical. Like very we critical. could literally see on the paper when I was shooting and we were you know, like setting all my stuff up, which shots I had not held my finger down afterwards there was no follow-through and the shots were all over the place and as soon as i was like okay don't let go don't let go don't let go and holding on all of a sudden the accuracy is just so much better yeah if you if you go back to that sort of analogy of the the trigger being the steering wheel of your rifle system you're you have the ability to steer that left or right if you're pulling back and you're pulling to the right you're gonna it's gonna influence your your shot it's gonna pull it one way or the other so same thing like if you're just pulling straight back and you should be pulling straight back, try to really keep that 90 degrees as it breaks, you keep that same pressure. And if you drop it all of a sudden, you're going to introduce uh, vibrations and, and harmonics in your whole system. That's going to make a difference. It absolutely does. So you, and, and Ken, like Justine said, I know tons of people that, uh, that do this, they'll, they'll sort of, as they're training this out of themselves or training it for the first time, they'll do a, a group of five. The first three, they'll remember the last two they won't. And there'll be two little groups. There'll be yeah. one up, you know, dead center. It'll be one up and to the right or whatever like that. So it's, it is that important. Um, it's something you really have to practice and, and, you know, repetitions, your friend there. It's yeah. gonna, it's gonna take a little while. If you've, if you're a pistol shooter, if you started on pistols, let's say, or semi-autos maybe, and you're just used to sort of jamming that and releasing really quickly. It's going to take a while, but as far as precision rifle shooting, it's very important. Yeah, trigger control for sure the whole way. Um, it's it's interesting because for me, like you you don't know what you don't know, and if you've never grown up shooting guns or whatever, you don't know not to slap the trigger or not to like completely jerk off your finger afterwards and let it do whatever. And um, so those those are uh, learned behaviors that I think are 
super critical to suffer somebody to tell you <laughs> when you start shooting things don't slap the trigger and like pull super hard with the crook of your finger mm -hmm. gentle until it surprises you and then follow through don't let go yeah. Um, and those are things that you just don't know unless somebody tells you not to do those things. Yep. Super true. Yeah. It's, uh, you don't, you wouldn't know that really. It's a, not a natural thing. If you were just to walk up to a gun for your very first time, no one's ever said that to you. It's just, it is that important though. Right? So yeah. it's one of those things. I'm, so, I'm really looking forward to that. The next range day here to like, there's just so much more intentionality that comes with, with this as opposed to like, totally. It was good today. It was not as good. It, like I, I didn't know all the, the ways that I could bring it in. And it was some days it was way better. Um, mm -hmm. And then others and, and just so many variables to try and, and zero in on. So, so yeah. much more than like, yeah, I put the crosshairs on the target and I pulled the trigger and like, yeah, this one day was great shooting. Next day was mm -hmm. shitty shooting. And like, you can totally hone that in so that every day is pretty damn good when you're out at the range. Yeah. You start, you start to learn all the variables. Shooting is, is about eliminating variables, whether it's in your body or, or in your rifle system or how you load or whatever, let's say, but you start to know, you start to, uh, with practice, know which variables make a difference to you, which you need to work on the most. It becomes pretty apparent if you just spend a bit of time, shoot, shoot a bit of paper, uh, just cat categorize exactly what you're doing from day to day. And you'll start to learn you know, what, uh, what you're doing, what you need what to work on. So mm. super important. I think the last, the last sort of, uh, bit of this, as far as fundamentals goes is breathing. And it's, uh, it's fairly important. It's, I wouldn't say it's <laughs> the most important, but, uh, it comes into play a lot in how it relates to hunting as well too. I'll get into, but, uh, you have, you have a bit more going on when you're in a stressful situation, uh, when you, when you're under time stress or when you, you, you only have a few seconds to get a shot off at an animal, let's say breathing is, uh, getting control of it is I'm not really going to talk about getting control of it, let's say, cause that's personal. Um, sometimes you might've just ran up a hill and you're just panting like crazy because <laughs> you're super out of shape and you should run more hills. <laughs> or, that's or I'm very just... offended right now. I feel personal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, or just say like, you know, you got a bit of buck fever going on. It does happen. So you'll, you'll have a natural cadence. You want to try to sort of control your cadence if you can. But as far as when you're, let's say you're, you're laying down and, or you're ready to take that shot, you, you will be breathing how fast you're breathing. It's depending on the situation, but what you want to do is try to saturate your, your blood with as much oxygen as you can in given the situation. So like, large deep breaths from your diaphragm if you can try to calm yourself down and saturate uh, your blood with as much oxygen as you can because that's going to slow your heart and slow your breathing cadence as well too which are both beneficial and you're going to basically uh depending on time pick I, I i'll sort of do that for a few seconds and then when i know i need to get ready i'll take two deep breaths as i'll breathe in and in and I'll as uh, deep as i can and I will, on the last exhale, I'll just pause about halfway. So you'll exhale about halfway and you'll just hold. And that's when you're, you're as, just as you start to, to hold, that's when you're going to start feeding pressure into your trigger. So you're going to have, you don't have a lot of time, depending on how much oxygen you already have in your bloodstream. Uh, you might start needing more pretty quick, but that hold is when your body's just going to calm down. Everything's going to stop moving. Your heart's moving as, as least as possible little as possible and uh you have that little window of a few seconds there sort of feed pressure feed pressure and it should be able to break it before you need to take another breath so it's incredible how much that pause changes things like even when i i went shooting in this past weekend uh, as well um and just remembering that to like pause just for a second it's like you get so much variability from your breath in like your up down or side to side or like just everything everything's moving all the time even though you look perfectly still while you're sitting at the bench mm -hmm. um and then you pause for a second and it's like oof, everything comes just stops focus. moving yeah what you'll notice as well too when you get good at this and when you are fairly calm is that when you're breathing and you have your natural wobble wobble zone in, in your scope let's say and you get that nice pause and everything comes and stops you'll start to notice your heart and you'll, if you can watch the, you can, in, in the reticle, basically you can watch your heartbeat ah. and just, you can, you can 
you want to get really technical, you can start to time it between your heartbeats as well too. But I don't really worry about that for general purpose. I just worry about uh, just calming yourself and just that little pause there at, at the midway of your of that uh, last breath. It it makes a difference. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. This is it's. Uh, I think at the end of this, we're. I- give you a heads up to prepare it but uh if we can have that like checklist of of things of just kind of the, the flyby on what we've talked about sure. it's been so good um i know like i'm i'm pretty much sure that you're you're doing your own loading and and i think maybe we'll save <laughs> that for another episode because that's a couple <laughs> episodes in itself Could be. but <laughs> off off the shelf ammo selection and and i've heard before you know is that ammo working well with your gun and and things like that can you maybe talk to that a bit? Sure, sure. So yeah, so this is a great question because I literally asked Dan this question like three days ago yeah. when I was trying to figure out why my twenty two doesn't shoot straight anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with all the six different types of ammo that I put through it. Yeah. So when it comes to factory ammo, there are so many different offerings, so many different grain weights, powder charges, different bullets, and things like that. And when it comes to your average rifle. Uh, and factory ammo, it's about validating and testing because you can basically get, let's say, three different types of ammo. Your rifle may not like any of those. It's about just going until you find one that your rifle likes. And no two rifles are going to be the same. Not even two rifles off the same production line sometimes would be the same. Every barrel is just a little bit different. So way you might want to approach that would be to... Uh, Pick a grain weight that you're happy with and pick a bullet construction that you're happy with. So let's say you want monolithic copper bullets. Let's say you want a bonded bullet or whatever, uh, a higher BC bullet, let's say. So pick a bullet that you're happy with. Can I pause for higher BC and um, maybe if we can... Yeah, what does that mean, that Dan? <laughs> yeah, so I just need a stoop. I'm stupid sign where it's just like, <laughs> yeah. no, no, help. <laughs> no, no, I'll I'll, def- I'll back up anytime. Um, ballistic coefficient is basically uh, the a numerical number assigned to a particular projectile to uh, give it uh, a reference point for how it cuts through, how efficiently it cuts through the air. So it's in reference to a standard, uh, a G1 or a G7 BC standard, um, and it relates to comparatively to that standard, how well or how not well does this bullet pass through the air. So uh, a higher BC will always mean that it's a more efficient bullet cutting through the air. But the most efficient bullets, as far as BC goes, may not be the most efficient for as far as terminal velocity goes, or uh, sorry, terminal performance so you you want to balance that. You want to, let's say, you need you need to have a copper bullet. It may not be the highest BC. Like the ones I hunt with for my big game rifle are monolithic. I'm sort of trying that out, and it's not the highest BC bullet by any means. Like most most bonded target bullets are a lot higher. So you have to sort of balance it like that. And when it comes to the performance you want from the bullet and the efficiency you want from the bullet, um, and and, and pick pick something in the middle there as far as the, the weight of the bullet as well too you know if depending on the, the type of game that you're going to go after you may want a higher or lower grain weight of bullets so okay so yeah. for so for the average joe who's like got a a rifle that they're trying to figure out what ammo is going to work for them yeah what it, what do they do so you go to your, your store, uh, local store, hopefully they got a good selection. See what's available right See now. See what's and... available. Yeah. yeah. If anything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, right now, not a lot, but um, you can, you can order online as well too. If you know, like, let's say for your, your, your case, Justina, you have a, a 308 and you've picked about 150 grain bullet and you're happy with a bonded uh, type of bullet or, or a soft nose, I think is what you're using now, but. Um, I you, will switch to copper. Yeah, yeah. So there aren't a huge lot of uh, copper offerings right now, full monolithic bullets. Uh, a good middle ground is a bonded bullet, like the Nostra AccuBond um, or something something like that. It holds together, holds its weight really well, does pretty good. Um, you don't get a lot of sort of missing lead in your animal or whatever. But let, but let's say you've, you've chosen that, that type of bullet and about grain weight. So you go to your store, you buy as many offerings as you can. This sucks, it gets expensive. Um, 
that you that you can afford or that have available to you in that weight and style. So let's say it's like three or four different boxes um, and you shoot them. So you shoot them four groups on paper from the prone in as little wind as you possibly can and in the best conditions that you possibly can. So taking out all the uh, all of the variables from yourself and your environment that you possibly can, you shoot them for groups. So your rifle will or won't like one or the other. Like you will noticeably see a difference in your group size mm -hmm. comparatively from one brand to the other. And it's just to do with the the type of bullet, like like the geometry of the bullet. You know, the the O drive and the bearing surface of the bullet might be different from one to the other. The BC might be different from one to the other. Charge weight, primer brass type sometimes makes a difference so your rifle will just tell you it'll say look i don't i don't like these ones i like these ones <clears throat> so when you say that um for for people who haven't ever tested ammo what does that mean or or i guess maybe i'll, I'll just say what i think that that means so my understanding from my conversation with you a few days ago is that uh when you're looking to figure out what ammo you're uh, gun likes it's what groups the best right it's not necessarily you've picked a spot and you're shooting at it and you're hitting it bang on every time um because unless you sight in your gun to that particular ammo it's not um, going to necessarily hit the target or the area that you're aiming for but rather right. if you can shoot you know say you're aiming for the same spot on the target with four different types of ammo and you end up grouping in four different areas your rifle is going to like a particular ammo better when you can see that it's grouping the best, even though you're aiming at the same spot yeah, every time. Correct. I get what you're getting at here. So that's the difference between point of aim and point of impact. And with different uh, ammo types, your point of impact will change. So your point of aim is going to be the same every single time. And actually, when I'm evaluating ammo, doing my load development, I will purposefully uh, click my scope off and to one side so that my point of aim, which is going to be dead center bullseye, is different from the point of impact. And just so I'm not chewing out the point of aim and I'm losing that sort of through my scope or whatever. Mm. But it, when it comes to what you're talking about, um, you, each ammo will be a little bit different. So let's say you've determined which one does group the best, then you will use your scope and you will track it in so that your point of aim and your point of impact is the same spot. When you're doing this group evaluation, don't really worry about your point of impact. Where it hits doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's the group size. So this was critical for me when I was trying to figure out why my 22, which was shooting so beautifully and so nicely when Dan and I had last shot it, uh, suddenly with all these different types of ammo in it, was like all over the freaking board. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Dan was like, Does, "Doesn't matter. Is it grouping?" And if it is, then if it's grouping better than the one you had in there, then that's better ammo for your gun. <laughs> yep, absolutely correct. And then you will use your scope to bring your point of aim, point of impact to the same spot. That's so, how you test your ammo. Yeah. So the, just the use bucket a bucket of bullets. They just those the, the the fat thousand round bucket. Oh yeah. Just <laughs> not grouping super tight anymore. Yeah. No, <laughs> no that, those don't tend to do that. No. <laughs> when it comes to twenty two ammo, you pretty much get what you pay for. It almost. You know, there are variations. My competition rifle uh, really, really likes uh, the SK line of ammo. And uh, it's that's by Lapua as well, too. But um, the higher the higher priced uh, Lapua ammo versus what I use actually doesn't get me any better groups. That's kind of a, an anomaly. Generally, the more you pay for a box of 22 ammo, the better groups you're going to get. And it's, it's about consistency and the, the line of how they produce it. Mm -hmm. And but, what's um, a, a cost per bullet kind of range for a, a 22 look like then? Uh, I've certainly never bought performance 22 rounds. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can get pretty nuts. So as far as what you get, like let's say CCI standard velocity, what you can get uh, your average Walmart um, pretty much anywhere. I think that's up to like... 13 bucks a hundred now roughly yep um now you can get into so what i i run sk long range mash in my competition 22 and i paid uh i'm like at 130 bucks for 500 now so oh, i thought you were gonna say for 100 and i was like no Ooh. it's not quite that bad <laughs> I, forget, I think so it, it's like over double 
Uh, and then you can go about double again when you get into some of the higher Lapuas and Ely matches and things like that. So you can go from, yeah, about 13, 14 cents around to getting close to 50 cents around. Wow. You get, you do get what you pay for when it comes to that. I mean, yeah. like, I expect my gun to shoot itself at that point. <laughs> yeah. But these, these sort of ammos through a good barrel, um, like I can, I can hit 350 yards. I can hit probably an eight inch play at 350 yards pretty much every time wind to side, let's say, and you know, I'm, I'm quarter inch grouping at 50 and my 200 yards is, you know, almost close to an inch. So yeah, just wow. over an inch or whatever. So uh, it makes a difference. It does, it does make matter. a difference. Yeah. Yeah. When you're, when you're sort of hunting with these sort of things, like I use my 22 for birds a lot, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've never shot a bird over about 30 yards. <laughs> comes to that sort of thing so cci standard velocity is my go-to for my hunting 22 ammo yeah cheap available works good but um but yeah when it comes to 22s evaluating them because you don't reload for 22 it's all about evaluating different ammo just get as much as you possibly can shoot it for groups use a little ruler or a set of calipers to to evaluate your group five round groups always five round groups and uh and what's the tightest consistently shoot five rounds of five and see what your average is there switch it out here okay here's a little tidbit as well too uh when it comes to 22s this um is sort of uh center fire it does apply as well too but sp particularly with 22s when you're switching ammo types um give it 15 to 20 rounds to foul the barrel with the new type of ammo so there's going to be a lubrication on the bullet it's going to be different from from maker to maker uh, you need, you need, you can't just evaluate the next group. You switch ammo and you, you do a, a crappy group. It's critical. Uh, straight, I did not know up. that. <laughs> yeah. It will always be, it'll never, it'll never be super tight. So give yourself three, three, five round groups or just sometimes you just shoot it, just get it done kind of thing. If it's not crazy expensive or whatever, but to evaluate the next load, you yeah. need to have to, to foul your barrel. So it's all nice with 22 when you start getting into large caliber. It's like, oh, this is an expensive. Uh, yeah. Do you want yeah. to zero in on this ammo real quick? Real quick. Yeah. 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 It's, it gets super expensive. And the good thing is once it's done, it's done. Like if that's if that's how you want to do it. Um, yeah. Reloading is obviously a super big advantage for that. But you really want to give yourself at least three or four different types. Give your gun a chance see what's what's best for it because there's there is going to be one that's going to be head and shoulders above above the rest now i'm questioning i'm like i certainly didn't do the proper elimination process on my 308 yeah. i uh i did the uh the three round shot um of a bunch of different ammos run right after the other and that's how i determined it yep yeah <laughs> pretty good, good. Five. And now I have a boatload of uh a federal blue box ammo so <laughs> I hope that's the one yeah. Yeah. It, you, you kind of sort of want to pick how far you go with that. Cause you might find one that's good enough. I and, think it's good enough. Like for, for me, for the purposes of not doing like competition shooting to do like, mm -hmm. uh, vital targets of a deer shooting, uh, it, it, it will suffice. Yeah. I've shot some great groups with core lock, believe it or not. So it, mm. it, it's not terrible. If you can shoot under an inch at a hundred yards consistently, I'd be pretty happy with for, for hunting for that sort of purposes. Um, and Although a hundred yards does not feel very far in the woods when you're looking at a deer, that's like 400 to 500 yards away. Yeah. And you're like, ah, you start getting into like the three, four, five. That's where you want to pick a, a better bullet possibly yeah. but with a better, better ballistic coefficient. Cause th those soft nose, like in the, in the blue box and stuff, you'll see it's a, it's a copper jacket and you'll see the lead coming out the front. It's different every from bullet to bullet like it's not really I that know. consistent so there are higher bc bullets ones with ballistic tips and things like that that make it more consistent for those purposes and you'll find if you track paper out to 500 yards you'll that's where you start to gain a bit of advantage with, with a higher a better bullet one day one day 500 yards dan <laughs> yeah. you can do it your gun's <laughs> capable of it I know my gun's capable of it. I am the limiting factor, yeah. the weakest link in the chain. We all are. <laughs> we all are. Like I, I still am. My gun, all my guns can shoot better than me. All of them. <laughs> and I'm See, still, you're taking away my excuses here, man. Like I gotta have some of this. 
a good yeah. carpenter always blames his tools. Oh, for sure. <laughs> it no, that's never more prevalent than in the shooting world. You will, guys will fiddle with their equipment and with their loads and, and things like that until the cows come home. But uh, at the end of the day, trigger time and, and getting your fundamentals right is just, that's where you're going to get your biggest gains. So I, yeah. I know I, I could literally just ask you questions all night long and, and want to be mindful of the time. I've got some more and then, and then I'm sure Justina has some more too, but um, maybe relatively quickly um, one, like newer hunters, let's kind of say you're, you're limiting to shooting 150 ish yards. Where are you zeroing your rifle um, to, to, accurately be able to get out and then be able to to accurately make those decisions i'll try to be quick on this one there's <laughs> a few concepts here depending on on how you have your stuff set up um me personally i would always zero my stuff at 100 yards it depends on how you're uh, getting your drop data so whether you have a, a, a bdc reticle like justina does whether you use Has the little notches that's yeah, you're wondering like what that your, means. it's built into your reticle for your particular round. Um, whether you use drop data on a card or something like that, uh, or whether you're doing uh, uh, like basically just a max point blank. Uh, for the a new shooter, let's say, and you don't expect over 150, 200 yards, it might be prudent to uh, to just do a point. And it just depends on your your round as well too how flat a shooting round is a three way is not a very flat shooting round but let's say you had a a little bit more flatter shooting round i would probably still zero at 100 and just expect that if i just put it on the vitals i'm gonna hit a little bit low maybe favor a little bit high if i know i'm kind of getting towards that 200 yards range uh, there is a school of thought as well too if you uh you can calculate your your max point blank as well too when it comes to let's say zeroing at 200 and then knowing uh, if you're at 100 how low you'll be if you're uh if you're at if you're over or whatever sorry high on the other side and low on the outside um and you can sort of do that calculation i've never really hunted that way i've my precision background kind of doesn't allow me to do that i kind of have to know where my bullet is gonna go and and so i so i use drop data but for the new shooter I would probably still suggest zeroing at 100 and just knowing that uh, and practice this as well too. Like go out on paper, like what we did with Justine as well too. Um, even if you don't have a BDC reticle, you have a simple duplex reticle, just uh, range out 200, fire your, um, if it, you're zeroed at 100, that is, fire at 200, see how low you are. If it's acceptable to you, if you're half an inch low, if you're an inch and a half low or whatever, you know that. You just build that into your, you can favor a little bit high or you can sort of, sort of build that into um, uh, your, like, you know, you could adjust your scope a little bit up. I, I wouldn't, I'd tend to zero at a hundred and just, and you, you know, know what you're doing, but if you're brand new, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of up to you. It's a personal thing. I think that's good advice. I think for the average person who is, um, looking to get into whether you're just shooting at the range or you are shooting to go hunting, um, hundred yards is like pretty standard. It's a standard. Yeah, yeah. Pretty standard to, to know that your gun is accurate at that. Yeah. And for the average center fire hunting rifle, 200, if you're zeroed at a hundred, a 200 yard shot is only going to be an inch low. Like mm -hmm. generally speaking, like yeah. it, it changes completely with your, your chambering, but it's, it's going to be well in the vitals of most big games. So yeah, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. A BDC reticle like Justina has is pretty, can be very useful um, if it's matched to your round. Mm -hmm. uh, hers is pretty good out to about 300. I think it would be within half an inch kind of thing. So yeah. that's a good option. It's super easy to do for a new hunter. But um, but yeah, like even if you're at 100, two, two is not going to be too much of an issue. Yeah. Awesome. Drew, did you have other questions? Uh, my last one, and and I think I probably know the answer to it, but just uh, are you doing a, a quick cleaning routine after every time you're out shooting a full? What's your, how do you maintain again with the, I'm sure we can do a, and we will do a full podcast on, on cleaning and maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, 
that can be another can of worms as well, too. That's what I was saying. I was like, controversial, Drew. <laughs> so, yeah, great, great question. I don't clean a super lot, to be perfectly honest. Um, oh. I, what? I will. This clean. is one of those things we're going to have to edit out later, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I guess care and maintenance in the field is a little bit of a, a different thing. Um, you know, making sure, you know, when, when you're, uh, let's say going from a cold environment to a warm and it sweats, you don't have a stainless barrel, like just making sure the health of your barrel, if, if you, that needed to happen, um, like you need to run some patches through to make sure it's going to be safe kind of thing. That's, that's one thing that's a little bit aside as far as just cleaning from shooting. Uh, I, We'll do a full deep clean, which is I consider uh, a carbon and a copper clean, uh, maybe every three to four hundred rounds. Uh, it depends entirely on your rifle, and it also depends on the round you're shooting. So the the one of the copper bullets, um, the Barnes in particular, uh, the TTSX and LRX, they will deposit more copper. Um, the Hornady, I'm running the Hornady GMX at the moment. It's not too bad. It's like a gilded metal, so it's it's a little bit better. They still probably deposit a bit more copper than your average jacketed bullet. But as far as like just carbon and copper, I have never found an accuracy drop off under 500 rounds. Um, bench rest guys will probably argue with me about that. But <laughs> as far as a field gun, um, yeah, I'd say... 250, 300 rounds would be the most I would ever clean a gun. Oh, good. I can stop cleaning my gun so frequently. <laughs> yeah, it's not. like I was neglecting a child. Like, I'm like, well, you know. I, I know. I, uh, yeah, I clean my gun way too much, man. It's probably, probably needs to be a little dirtier. <laughs> and, and that's also separate from, let's say, like dirt and dust and grime and, and, yeah. and stuff from the field. Like that stuff I'll take care of. I will, I'll clean all the dirt out of, out of my bolt and things like that. Yeah. I'll, I'll oil it and things like that. But just as far as like barrel cleaning patches and barrel yeah like yeah. a proper barrel cleaning it's not all that necessary all that often like yeah yeah i've uh, one of my comp guns i ran to like 800 rounds when i was still shooting tight groups so wow it's a relief it's, yeah <laughs> it's not too bad <laughs> semis are a bit different um they get dirtier quicker yeah semi shotguns um your semi 22s and stuff they get a little bit dirtier so i might do it a little bit a little bit sooner with that but as far as a, a center fire like business rifle hunting or field field gun kind of thing yeah don't don't worry about 250 300 rounds perfect wonderful <laughs> that's like 100 years for most people so. yeah well, i know i'm like for the guys true. who only shoot three rounds a year you know? that's true that's true that's great if you're gonna put it away for for the year like if i'm not gonna touch it for six months or whatever yeah i'll probably run a couple of dry patches through it but i won't do a full clean by any means yeah um, okay. So to wrap up, we have a few rapid fire questions for you. So we need to know the, the, the critical mass question. Do you wear double socks or single socks when you go out hunting? I will wear double socks. So <laughs> okay. I'll either do stock liners and a set of sort of like darn tops or something like that. If it's not too hot. Uh, so sock you don't liners. Yeah. Sock that, liners. yeah what's a sock old liner? lady sock liners. They're kind of old lady sock liners. <laughs> yeah. But they stop you from getting blisters. It's, they're pretty mm. good. So you, you get that friction between the sock layers, uh, instead of your, your, your boots and your foot. So oh. that, um, and then I, I get cold quick. I, the cold gets to me really quick. Uh, so if it's cold, I'll wear just, I'll wear, uh, two sets of Merino to be honest. And, Stuff them sock liners my... and two sets of merino. Uh, no, I'll probably just do like a, a medium weight and then a heavy weight sort of merino. Fair, I think I've oh, stretched yeah. my boots out to the point now where I, if I don't wear double socks, uh, if I'm like slipping around in there, it's like yeah. ocean room worth of swimming in my boots now. Yeah, I've, I've winter, winter boots like uh, some danners that are purposefully a little bit bigger for that exact reason. Yeah. Definitely. I, um, it's, it's socks are the one thing. It's like, it's not a huge uh, additional expense. It's like, yeah, go right to the top. Buy a nice, so Merino, like, yeah. you might as well. You have yeah. to. I cheaped out once and I didn't wear Merino wool socks. I was just like, oh, I'll just wear like my sport socks or whatever. Blisters for days. Mm. It was the worst decision of my life. Always wear expensive socks. Yeah. Stay away from cotton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was the problem. Um, okay. And then we need to know 
what is your favorite snack to bring with you in the field? Hmm. Good question. Um, <laughs> I'll usually have some deer or bear sausage, some oh. sort of like dry sausage. I'll I'll take that keeps pretty good. Um, hard to go by the the trail mix as well too. I'll just sort of do your average trail mix. Uh, do do with you the mangoes eat in it a lot? At, oh, with the mango. I was like, do you yeah. eat the M and M's out of the trail mix first? <laughs> no, I found one that's yeah. It's got mangoes and coconut and some chocolate covered raisins too for a little bit of sweetness. So Ooh, that is that. fancy trail mix. That's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> is that cheaping out on bullets, socks, or trail mix? Or trail mix. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are all very key pieces to yeah. have the best. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that that's it for me for rapid fire questions. Yes, and I have a, about 150 more questions, but I know that uh, we'll have to save those for another time. And um, this has been wildly valuable. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my thank pleasure. you I, so much, Dan. I'm looking forward to the next time to the range and and having a chance to put this into action. Yeah, mm, definitely. Yeah, this definitely. is this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg, but hopefully these are a few points that uh, that can point in the right direction and, and some other people as well too and become better shooters, which means better, more effective, more ethical hunters. That's that's the idea. Key, key. Yeah, and we will definitely have you back to chat more about all of the other things associated with this. We didn't even, we just barely mm. scratched the surface of Kinda, this. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Nice. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening wherever you are. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find us everywhere that podcasts and video podcasts are found. And if you have any comments or reviews, please drop them down below. We will get back to you. Or you can reach us at questions at entrypointhunting.com. And if you happen to know somebody who you'd recommend we talk to, whether they're an expert, an amateur, or growing in the sport, uh, be sure to tag them in the comments or shoot us a message with their info. And until next time. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. <laughs> it so I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it recording for one second because I want to try something. I didn't want to try it during the the show, but uh, this had like a great me. flow. Nice. <laughs> um, but I just want to try because some of the other the the podcasts that I watch they'll have a a different like <laughs> basically. It'll be, you know, the, the focus conversation and then, you know, as the next person talks and just if, you know, even just a oh, debrief yeah. of it, just to, just to just see what that looks and like. And then we can, yeah. can look at it afterwards. Hmm. So okay. I do have, I was going to, I was going to try and do when we were in studio here to have like, uh, uh, a camera on me and then a camera on Dan and then have my big wide angle camera, have the whole scene in it. And one day when I have a bigger table, we can have three people at the table and then we can have cameras on everybody. Just got to yeah. the, watch the the buy and sells and find that uh, camera for you or the, the table. Yeah, this table was free. So if you can find me a slightly bigger table of this, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, so Dan, one question. Australia what was it like like when I moved to Germany and we did some I went I went out and I tried to get in I had one guy that he runs a trap line there and he was a big hunter oh, yeah. and he was going to take me out but I had to flee because of COVID but um <laughs> what was that like because they're you know I follow Green Tree and and see it bits but it's different world yeah yeah it, it is a different world I, I spent about 15 years there and um uh did a, a bit of hunting as well too uh, got into sort of started my i was i think i was pretty young when i went over that I was about 19 or so so i started my long range real center fire long range sort of career over there but um yeah it was great uh red deer um fallow deer lots of kangaroos lots of hogs things like that uh, it's it's a lot a lot of fun it's a lot of space there's just it's a super dynamic or so like Did diverse you shoot country a kangaroo? oh many many kangaroos yeah. uh what yeah. they're really tasty they're really no. good <laughs> they're just keeping the reaction cam up for this one yeah <laughs> australia is the, uh, the only country in the world where you can eat both animals on their uh, coat of arms so oh yeah an emu and a kangaroo and they're both quite delicious so what? yeah not the big reds like you probably imagine they're just the eastern grays and they're um oh yeah, yeah. they're very tasty you get them in the supermarkets too like uh really yeah oh wow they're everywhere so what is what is kangaroo tasting like 
It's a lot like beef, leaner, I guess, than beef, but it looks and tastes a lot like beef. Um, it has a little bit of its own taste, but it's quite a nice mild taste. It's, mm. it's nice. Funny story, I, uh, I came back here three years ago from Australia, I guess, and uh, um, I heard that there's a kangaroo farm in Kelowna. And so <laughs> you I can't was, shoot those well, ones, Dad. I, I went up and I was like, oh, great. I haven't had kangaroo in ages. This is going to be great. And I was like, <laughs> like no, you, you pet them. You don't, you don't eat them. So they're for friends. Yeah. Not for food. Yeah. <laughs> apparently. So you can't, don't, can't eat the kangaroos here, but they are delicious. So you, you showed up with a shopping cart and you were very confused when you got there. <laughs> or, or a what? shotgun. Well, no, I didn't quite get, get all the way there, but uh, that was the, that was the reaction from a lot of other people too. Yeah. Shock and horror. So yeah. Uh, there <laughs> just roll up to the front. Them. You're like, so what's the, the per pound? Like, what <laughs> yeah, are we yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Can I get them pre pre frozen or what? Like, <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. mine in kangaroo patties. Um, yeah. and then half in meatballs. <laughs> no, they wouldn't do it. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's too funny. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been wildly informative like it, it right? just, don't you feel like a noob with your gun now a hundred percent and and i think that maybe we're the oddities but i really do think that it it's literally for everybody you go out you put the put the the crossy bit on the shooty bit and you keep pulling until you get closer you and closer bit. to it that's yeah. that's yeah. all that i it's did not you're not the oddities it's pretty common and uh it's yeah it's not it's uh, it's something that I just uh, I enjoy working with people to try to make them better shooters because I I feel like it is such an important part of being a good hunter is to be a good shooter and I've seen a lot of really good hunters make bad shots or miss great shots kind of thing because of simple things that just shouldn't have happened. So I you know um, I said to Dan Drew that if I knew now. Yeah. No, if I knew at the start of last hunting season what I know now, and if my gun was dialed in <laughs> the way that it is now, I might have had two deer in the freezer yeah. this year. Never know yeah. yet. Like you found two of them. That's that's a huge part. That's definitely a, a very hard part of it. I think yeah. um I think if you were able to have got some support, either prone or or just modified on your knee or, or just something. Yeah. You might have been a different totally. story. So. The, the first one, a hundred percent. Um, like if I had better confidence in my capacity to use my gun, it was a wide open shot. There was nothing blocking the way. Okay. I just, as a shooter was like, I need to be super freaking close. Cause I don't, I'm not good with my gun. I don't, yeah. I don't want to miss it. And I don't want to make an unethical shot. Yeah. Um, Which and is then natural the second, and, and yeah. that's, and, you know, not having practice, that was probably a smart move, but yeah. And then the just, second one was just like stupidity. We were yeah. so so close, literally reach out and like slap it. Oh, wow. um, Crazy. Yeah. but uh, yeah, not patient enough to wait for the right shot. So. Yeah, I think I told you as well too. Of of all the shots I've taken on animals, probably ninety percent was from full prone. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. Like you can almost always find a way to get full prone. And there's a couple situations where you can't, like really tall grass or, so, or something like that, but you can get prone you're gonna make a good shot because yeah. that's how you you practice like that's the most stable way to practice stable way to shoot period yeah well and it definitely feels better than it looks yeah. <laughs> it looks like it would be an awkward thing to be doing and uh, i still every time i see somebody shooting prone i'm like oh they look like they have to like hold themselves up and stuff and and then yeah. even yesterday i was out and and the guys that i was with were like oh we're gonna shoot off this tree stump and i'm like uh, I'm going to go lay in the snow over there. Yeah. <laughs> and like, it just immediately, as soon as you're in that position, you're like, yep, this is awesome. Yeah. This is way yeah. better. And it doesn't have well, to it's... be like on the ground ground too. Like I've shot high prone off uh, like a, a fallen tree mm. and I've taken my backpack and thrown it. So I'm like it, taking up that space in my, in my chest or whatever. And I'm sort of on an angle, but I'm fully rested. The gun's rested. I have yeah. like control of everything and you're going to make a good shot. Yeah. What were you going to say, Drew? Well, just like the the interesting piece of those the ranging shots in in BC hunting or Okanagan hunting, it's like yeah, like if you can see sixty yards, sometimes that's a real long, yeah. long pull you're looking for. It can be like that, yeah, for sure. Especially whitetail hunting, mule deer hunting, you can get into uh, a little bit longer. Sometimes they're usually a bit higher and a bit clearer up. And dumber, they'll just stand there for longer. <laughs> yeah, 
we do and appreciate they usually that. get another chance to if you spook them they'll usually turn around but um but yeah mule deer hunting elk hunting that's uh where you can start to get into a little bit longer yeah. longer range stuff and if you're confident it's it can be a lot more effective your freezer will be a lot fuller <laughs> yeah a lot fuller than the empty it is now yeah. bear to bear yeah. too they're usually up high yeah, yeah. um Okay, well, I hate to cut this short, but it's no, Chinese it's... New Year's Eve, and I'm supposed to go to Chinese New Year's oh, Eve dinner. Uh oh. Oh, we had. Chinese I know my mom texted me this morning. She's like, "You coming for dinner?" And I was like, "Uh, I have an interview that I booked weeks ago. Sorry, I'll be there after." <laughs> she was like, "Well, okay. I'm very glad that you uh, ditched your mom for this." So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you um... so much. No, no, absolutely. That was awesome. I appreciate the, the opportunity. And uh, if there's anything else you guys sort of want me to do more deep dives on or, or focus on or whatever. Oh yeah, definitely. There around. will be, there will be deep dives into subtopics of this. Like yeah, I didn't even, could, yeah, I didn't even ask. We could do question. a whole podcast. That's just you, like just an entire <laughs> line of, of, cause it is, there's so this much. This is the dance it. show. Yeah. It's the dance series. Yeah. There, yeah. Well, and that's, there's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, the one thing I didn't ask and, and I'm going to ask it right now cause I can cut it back into it later. Um, is there like a, a call? Can we direct, like, can people pay you to take them out? Can we, like, is there something that, uh, yeah. we can give back to you? Cause you've given away hey, a ton for free. Um, I'd happily hire you for, for a session to take me out. Um, once yeah. I do a couple sessions trying to just break the really <laughs> bad habits, uh, but is there anything, any way that we can direct people to you? Any request you have the audience? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know that I'd want to charge people. I'm, I'm happy to teach people. I'm, if I can get a new shooter into, into the sport or get someone, you know, make a breakthrough or whatever, that's, that's super makes me feel good too. Like that's payment enough. So you buy them beers and yeah. food then if you want them to like beers spend some foods. time with you yeah. and help you like hone in your gun to you you can pay him in beer and food then like and goodwill and <laughs> i'm yeah. putting it in the budget right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm happy awesome. i'm always happy to help i i had a, i had help from some pretty good teachers when i was young and um yeah i really like getting people into it and paying it forward yeah for sure nice cool. well thank you so much dan i really appreciate your uh, a real quality human <laughs> with a ton of information so thank yeah. you yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, Drew and and Dan's leaving us soon. He's moving to the island. So if you want to, uh, if you want human time to meet him in real life, you better make that happen. Uh, how how long I'll do we be, got? I'll be back and forth. So uh, I'm gonna do the first sort of move probably in two or three weeks. But um, I'll be back and forth lots. I I the, all the center fire matches that I shoot are, are in and around here. So I'll be yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll keep you anchored here as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a, a good shooting buddy that I compete with too. He's, he won't let me go too far. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Well, awesome. Justina, Thanks, enjoy dinner. Thank I you, will. Dan. We'll talk yeah. to you soon. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you, man. Thank you. All right.